Thanks for reminding me. Is it working? Seems seems to be working. According to this, Let it's me... cool. <laughs> All right. So well it's it's working. I, I just check it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this series of Quantum Matter Seminars, uh, which this week has the pleasure to receive another experimental talk with Jonathan Pedicciari, uh, who is going to talk about uh, RIC's experiments in ultra twin quantum materials. Thank you very much, Join Jonathan, for uh, accepting your invitation. Uh, just before starting uh, his talk, I would like to remind all the uh, attendees here in the Zoom that you are will be allowed to unmute yourself and do a question, whatever uh, you like. So with that, I think we are all set to start. So Jonathan, please start. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and also for, uh, for the invitation to, to this talk. This is actually my first virtual talk and seminar, so I hope that everything will go smooth. So um, during today's talk, I will talk about our recent uh, investigation using resonant inelastic X-ray scattering in the field of uh, ultra thin films and uh, quantum materials. So the outline of, um, of my talk is uh, to start with a pretty short introduction of uh, what resonant inelastic X-ray scattering is and what we can actually do with, uh, with it. And then I will move on uh, explaining two different cases of how RICS can be applied and used to investigate um, ultra thin uh, films of different materials. Uh, please interrupt me at any time if you have a question and don't wait till the end, otherwise we could lose uh, the, the, the flow. So I, I will start with, with a slide just to tell you that um, in a strongly correlated electron system, the electron has a different personality. And if we take uh, the electron in, uh, in vacuum, it has a charge and it has a spin. When we place an electron inside uh, an atom, it also acquires an orbital momentum. And what is extremely interesting is that when uh, we place electrons into a strongly correlated system and we allow them to, to interact, these three degrees of freedom can actually separate and give rise to a pretty interesting class of phenomena. In particular, you can consider that uh, we have a crystal where we have a lattice, then we have the orbital and the spin and the charge degrees of freedom. We have a strong interplay between all of these degrees of freedom that can lead to extremely interesting macroscopic properties, such as magnetism, uh, ferroelectricity, and the combination of them is a multiferroic system. But this is to say that the strongly correlated system have a pretty large interest in uh, fundamental research, but also in applied research because that can give rise to tangible properties of, uh, of materials. But from, uh, from my perspective, one question that we should try to answer is, uh, if we want to understand quantum materials and their properties, what do we need to know? And here, uh, now I will try to attempt, I will attempt to, to give you an answer to this based on my little knowledge. So one aspect that is extremely important in strongly correlated electron system is uh, the electronic order. In fact, as I mentioned before, by the splitting of the three fundamental electronic degrees of freedom, this can lead to uh, peculiar orders in, in solids. Uh, such as the charge order, which has been long studied in uh, cuprate superconductors, but also in uh, classical and classical material. Another order 
Neutronic order that is pretty important is magnetic order that can take the form of antiferro, ferro, antiferro magnetism. And then lastly, the orbital order that appears in, uh, in some materials such as the manganides. And it is important to describe the order parameter in, in electronic solids and their symmetry in order to understand their static properties. But besides the static properties, it is important to understand what are the elementary excitations and the, electronic the electrons dynamics in this material. And here I want to present all of the degrees of freedom, all of the different excitations that are important to be known if we want to understand and explain the interaction present inside materials. On the order of EV, we have charge transfer and DD excitations. And then as we decrease the energy, we have manions and spin excitation. And as we decrease more the energy, we have phonon excitation. And nowadays we can also add even lower energy based on amplitude and phase modes. And on this aspect, resonant X-ray scattering is a pretty powerful technique because it can be used to investigate both of these aspects in quantum materials. In fact, when we perform what is called resonant elastic X-ray scattering, where the incident energy is the same of the outgoing energy, we can study in a similar way to diffraction, but with a, a sensitivity to electronic orders, all of the degrees of freedom that I mentioned before and the wave vector of these orders, as well as their dependence in, in temperature and possibly also for uh, different control parameters. On the other hand, when we perform resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, so the incident energy is higher than the outgoing energy, which means we leave the system in an excited state, we can investigate the dynamics and the interaction present in the system, as well as the local and the collective excitations. And due to the pretty complete interaction of X-rays compared to other probes, we can investigate all of the electronic degrees of freedom. As I said before, we can investigate the charge, we can orbit investigate the orbital degrees of freedom, the spin excitations, so the magnetic degrees of freedom and lattice vibrations. But now let me try to go a bit more, a bit deeper into what resonant inelastic ray scattering is. So RICS is a photon in, photon out spectroscopic technique where we use, we normally use a synchrotron radiation to produce a tunable incident X-ray beam that is select that selects the absorption energy of our material. In our material, if we were to draw the energy levels, we have at low energy, the core level, we have the valence band, the Fermi level, and an empty conduction band. When we excite with a resonant photon, uh, this excitation, we excite one electron from the core level inside the conduction band, and we create a highly unstable short-lived intermediate state, which is also equivalent to what we call X-ray absorption spectroscopy. This intermediate state is unstable because it has a core level and it, it has to relax somehow. And what's, what is happening is that a valence band electron can jump into this core level, filling it in with the consequent emission of an outgoing photon with a specific energy, momentum, and polarization. And if we look how we left the system, the system is left with a hole into the valence band and an electron into the conduction band, which means that it has acquired uh, an energy. And when we analyze the incident and outgoing photon, we can essentially detect a peak as a function of energy loss, which corresponds to this excitation. This is extremely important because depending on this uh, energy analysis, we can uncover, as I said before, charge transfer, DD, uh, excitation, manion excitation, and phonons. If we were to look a bit more um, a theoretical perspective, if we want to describe the Riggs process, we need the Kammer-Seisenberg formula. 
which involves a, a second order process where we have to involve two dipole operator and we have the intermediate state here, the final state here, and we want to calculate the Ricks intensity, we have to sum over all the possible intermediate state. Importantly, Ricks is chemical and site selective because we can tune the incident energy to an absorption edge and select the site, so which atom we decide to investigate and also which orbital depending on the X-ray absorption profile. This is an inelastic process, so we can investigate all of the stations that are accessible as a function of energy loss. Additionally, an advantage over optical spectroscopies is that we can transfer momentum because normally we work in the soft or hard X-rays and the energies of this X-ray is high enough that they can carry momentum. And such a momentum can be exchanged with the system. Finally, a bit more technical concerns the possibility of performing polarization investigation. So we can selectively tune the incident polarization in order to select different orbital states or even different magnetic states. Just to give you a few examples of what RICS can do and what uh, RICS has done in the past, I'm showing here a few examples of what we call soft X-ray rigs, which, which, which in, implies an incident energy between 200 EV and two kilo electron volt. And these comprehend essentially all the 3D transition methods. So rigs has been used to investigate the spin excitation in two dimensional cuprates, iron based superconductors and nickel oxide. It has been used to study the electronic structure of uh, different uh, thin films, for example, in the nickelase. There has been work also on uh, LAO, STO systems in the past. Rix has been used to investigate phonon excitation and the connected electron phonon coupling in low dimensional system and two dimensional cuprate, and also to study the effect of charge density waves on. Uh, phonon excitations. RIGS has also been used, uh, for example, to investigate uh, spin liquid material or possible spin liquid material and to, to investigate the spin orbit separation in uh, one dimensional material such as strontium copper oxygen chain. Additionally, RIGS can be used to perform energy resold resonant elastic X-ray scattering to investigate the interplay between electronic orders and their collective excitations. Now, experimentally, this is uh, our beamline and they want to show you because it is uh, kind of, we are kind of proud of, of this machine. So here we have the beamline coming from the synchrotron beam. Down there, we have our sample chamber. We have here the spectrometer tank. This is the spectrometer arm and here we have our detector, which is 15 meters long. Now, uh, from uh, a few, few extra details on the beamline, the beamline is 105 meters long from the synchrotron to the sample. The spectrometer is 15 meters long and we can continuously rotate the scattering angle along these, uh, along these, uh, uh, arc to perform momentum result studies. Now, if I succeed, I want to show you also a video and how this object can actually rotate, which is pretty impressive. Additionally, uh, at our beamline at uh, SLS2, we also set the new world record in terms of uh, energy resolution and uh, we achieved uh, 22 milli electron volt as the copper L edge, which is actually uh, pretty good. It's still a bit uh, uh, far from conventional neutron scattering experiment, but we will work on, uh, on getting better. Now, I will now start the second part of my talk where I will um, show our last uh, uh, measurements on uh, the spin dynamics 
on uh, magnetic thin films of iron as a function of, of thickness. And I want to show you in one slide um, the properties of iron, which is a bit embarrassing <laughs> uh, considering the, the audience, but iron is a convention, is a, I would say it's the most known ferromagnetic material. It is a three-dimensional di three itinerant ferromagnet and it has a body-centered structure. So it has a spin excitation that can disperse on the three direction. It has an yield temperature that is pretty high, which is about 1000 Kelvin. And also it, it is present in a 3D6 S2 configuration. And the spin excitation of iron have been measured by neutron scattering a long time ago, back in 1973. And it was shown that uh, the bandwidth and spin excitation energy is isotropic along the three crystallographic direction. And it, it follows a quadratic path. And in our study, we selected iron as a, as a benchmark to understand what we can do with rigs in this material. And normally when you start a rigs experiment, the first step is to collect X-ray absorption. So we collected X-ray absorption at the iron L edge, which is at an energy of about 700 and seven, 708 electron volt. And we observed this pretty broad feature, which is normal for uh, 3D transition metals. This transition, as I said before, it is a transition from the 2P core level into 3D uh, level. Once you have done an X-ray absorption, the next step in a, in a RIGS experiment is to start collecting uh, spectra is a function of energy loss at different incident energy. So we selected, we fixed the incident energy across this absorption edge, and we measured what we observed as a function of energy loss. And here in this left plot, I'm showing the incident energy on the vertical axis and the energy loss as a horizontal axis. And as intensity, as color intensity, we have the intensity of our rig spectrum. And we can observe that at zero energy, we have an elastic line and most of the signal goes into this broad hump, which is essentially fluorescence, which is pretty boring. But when we look into more details into our iron uh, sample, we can observe that at zero energy loss, we have an elastic peak here. And at several, tens of milliev, we have a peak that we ascribe to spin excitations. And then, as I said, at higher energy, we have the fluorescence, which is an incoherent relaxation from the bands of, of iron. Now, uh, having observed this, we decided to investigate how the spin excitation dispersion is present in a thin film of iron, which has bulk characteristics. So in this case, we selected a 105 units iron film and we measured the, the dispersion. So here I'm showing uh, on the left-hand side of this slide, the momentum dependence of our rig spectra uh, for a iron bulk film, iron-like bulk film. And essentially what we observe is that as we decrease the transfer momentum to the system, the peak that we ascribe to the spin excitation is decreasing in energy and dispersing. And by performing this measurement, we were able to collect the spin excitation dispersion for an iron film as a function of uh, momentum along the 0,0L direction. And here on this uh, plot where I'm showing you the energy loss as a function of uh, position in, uh, along the 0,0L direction, I'm showing you the comparison between our RICS data and inelastic neutron scattering data that were collected back in the day. And it is remarkable to see that our experimental measurements are pretty close to what we was observed um, by inelastic neutron scattering. But as I said at the beginning, 
neutron scattering also observed an uh, isotropy of the spin excitation along different crystallographic direction. So in order to prove this, we also change the direction of in-plane momentum transfer. And we compare the measurements between uh, 0, 0, L direction versus uh, H0, 0 direction. And here I'm showing the, the Rick spectra that we collected. And as a function of momentum, they look pretty identical in terms of uh, uh, spin excitation energy. However, now I want to introduce here the concept when we have a thin film, because when uh, the next step will be to uh, thin these, uh, this, these iron samples, and they want to identify the how to plane direction, which is what I will call 0, 0, L, and the in-plane direction, which is what I will call H0, 0. So the next step of our investigation has been to perform uh, this momentum resolved investigation along 0, 0, L and H0, 0 for different film thicknesses. So here I'm showing um, selected risk spectra. So we have the intensities versus energy loss for all of the films that we measured. So we, have, we covered a pretty large range because we started from 105 unit cell and we measured risk spectra down to three unit cell films. And what we observed is that at a specific momentum point, the spin excitation energy seems to be decreasing along the zero, zero L as a function of uh, momentum. So apparently we have a softening of the spin excitations along the zero, zero L as we decrease the thickness of our samples. Now, when we look at the H0,0 direction, so the in-plane direction, which has not been affected, which is not affected by, by the thickness, we observed very little change of the spin excitation energy. So this brings to, to two observations. One is the softening of the spin excitations along the 0, 0, L direction as we decrease the thickness. The second is that based on the thickness, we have an anisotropic evolution between in-plane and out-of-plane directions. Now, we, could, uh, we have to look into possible reasons because of the, to, that could lead to this anisotropic response of the spin excitation. And we thought about uh, possibilities that we have an electronic band reconstruction due to the reduced thickness. However, this is unlikely to explain our observed trend because we observe a softening of the spin excitation already in a film that is 29 units cell, which is relatively thick. The second effect that we thought was a possible hybridization between the iron band with the MGO substrate. However, this is unlikely because MGO is a wide band insulator and it has no bands close to the Fermi level, which could hybridize with bands of iron leading to a reconstruction of the spin excitation dispersion of our film. Another possible reason could be the strain. However, we performed a measurement, a diffraction measurement that showed that 29 unit cell films are already almost fully relaxed. So this leaves confinement as a possible uh, explanation for our experimental evidence. However, in order to further explore this possibility, we asked help to theoreticians and we performed uh, an isotropic Eisenberg modelization of, of, of a system where we used a nearest neighbor um, Eisenberg model, an isotropic one, where the exchange interaction was modulated in, in with, with this formula where P stands for, uh, uh, as an exponent, stands for an interaction that would be long or short range, as also shown in uh, this plot. And if we want to better visualize how these J interaction changes as a function of space, we investigated two possible values. 
One is the P equal four, which is a long range interaction. The other one was a P equal eight, which is a short range interaction. So the short range interaction is essentially limited to the nearest neighbor. Whereas if we take the long range interaction, we have a much wider range of, uh, of exchange. Based on this model, um, the spin excitation dispersion was uh, calculated for um, in-plane and out-of-plane directions. And what we observed was that for the long-range interaction, we had a softening of the spin excitations as a function of, of thickness that is uh, on the same extent between the in-plane and out-of-plane interaction. Whereas when we used a short range J interaction, we observed a softening along the out of plane direction, but in the in plane direction, we observed a much smaller softening of the spin excitation. So these later um, parameters was able to explain our anisotropic uh, response. And based on these calculations, we we, we compared our experimental results with, uh, with this uh, Heisenberg model. And I'm showing here uh, the, the results. So I'm showing the dispersion relation as a function of uh, exchange momentum along the in-plane and out-of-plane direction for different thicknesses. So you can see as in the out-of-plane direction, these simple short range J interaction was able to uh, explain the softening of the spin excitation. And this, uh, this model was also able to explain the invariance of the spin excitation in the in-plane um, direction. On top of this, based on this calculation, calculation we could uh, make a step further as they are simply based on the gain or loss of uh, iron bonds uh, due to the confinement. So it is a simple geometrical parameter. And what we could do was to calculate if you uh, a softening factor, which is how much the spin excitation energy changes as a function of thickness. And we observed that these, uh, the calcula this calculation actually follows a, a power law which can be used in principle to, as, a, as a calibration and can be used in material synthesis in order to tune the spin excitation energy. And this is uh, something that is particularly appealing in fields such as spin sonic and magnonics, where, uh, it is, where uh, the community is looking for materials that have a tunable spin excitation energy. Now, I will conclude this um, section of, uh, of my talk uh, by presenting our conclusion, which is that um, we presented, I presented um, an investigation of the evolution of the spin excitation in a magnetic thin film using RICS. And they want to state once more that this is pretty remarkable that uh, RICS is able to investigate materials that are extremely thin, as thin as three units uh, in this case, and still get reasonable results in a reasonable amount of time. And this opens a completely new research line, which is the investigation of, uh, of thin films uh, using uh, this pretty advanced spectroscopy. Uh, we observed for the first time ferromagnetic excitations in uh, bulk-like films that were 105 and 54 units are thick. And we were able to reproduce the three-dimensional three ferromagnetic uh, excitations that were measured by inelastic neutron scattering, which makes RICS a reliable technique to perform this kind of investigation because this is, RICS is a pretty novel technique and it requires uh, a strong comparison with more mature technique as a neutron scattering. And based on this uh, ground working, we investigated the, the thickness dependence of, uh, of magnetic thin films, observing 
non-isotropic evolution of the spin excitation along the 0, 0, L outer plane and H0, 0 in plane direction. And uh, we observe a softening that can be easily modeled by a pretty simple Heisenberg-like model and can be used also to calibrate additional ma new materials to tune the spin excitation energy. And finally, as a, as a last conclusion, I want to state that uh, in our investigation, we demonstrate that confinement is a, a pretty in tune, important knob that can be used to design a material that can be used for, for device where the magnetic refractive index can be changed and tuned at will. Now, if there are not any questions, I will move to the third part of my talk. Are there any questions? Okay, so I will move on to the next part of, uh, of uh, my talk, which is the evolution of the spin excitation and low energy excitation in iron selenium, where we, investigation, we, where we investigated the evolution of the low, LN, low energy uh, electronic excitation in iron selenium using RIGS from the bulk down to the monolayer. So I want to start with a pretty short introduction of uh, iron-based uh, superconductors. So iron-based superconductors are a pretty recent uh, mat class of material where high temperature superconducted superconductivity was discovered back in uh, 2008. And what is uh, extremely important is that after many years, um, um, superconductivity has been discovered in uh, many different structures of iron plintides. Here, I'm highlighting the possible structures where superconductivity has been observed, starting from what is called the 11 system, the 111, the 1111, and, and more complex structure. These are, uh, but however, in all of these material, uh, there is something that is common, which is a iron arsenide or iron selenide layer, which is where the, the interesting physics is, in, in particular where the superconductivity is and where the iron is present with uh, a 3D6 electronic configuration. And these materials are, most of them in the, in the parent compound are antiferromagnetically ordered material. And this is important because when we look at generalized, uh, as a generalized phase diagram of iron-based superconductors, we have a parent material, parent compound that is <clears throat> antiferromagnetically ordered. And then as we dot the system with either holes or electrons, we suppress the antiferromagnetism and we gradually induce superconductivity with a typical superconducting ion. Differently from, uh, from the cuprates, however, these compounds are, are metallic and they are also multi-orbital systems where the electronic correlation also arises from Hans coupling. Now, in, in more detail, <clears throat> I want to focus on the iron selenium that is a pretty special case within the iron-based superconductors because it has a simple structure. In fact, it is composed only on a iron layer where we have a selenide ions above and below and where iron is tetrahedrically coordinated. Contrary to most of the stoichiometric compounds in the iron plintides and chalcodenides, uh, iron, selenide, iron selenium doesn't have any long range magnetic order, but the ground state is preser, uh, uh, superconductivity at each Kelvin. However, it, is, uh, uh, it presents a pretty high magnetic moment, which implies a strong magnetic fluctuation and a higher temperature, it's about 50 Kelvin, this material also has a um, pneumatic transition. But what is even more interesting is that when you grow iron selenium 
on a, on a substrate and you limit the thickness to one unit cell, the superconductivity, the superconducting temperature is boosted by almost an order of magnitude. And if we were to place in this diagram where we plot the TC versus the year of discovery, we would see that iron selenium monolayer has a, a, a pretty, uh, to serve a pretty strong uh, point and position compared to, to all the other iron-based superconductors. And it is the one that presents the highest temperature. And a few questions now emerge, which are concerning the, the role of the substrate. In fact, the substrate could, uh, could uh, provide phonons that shows the electron phonon coupling can co couple to the electronic degrees of freedom, boosting um, the superconductivity in iron selenium. The substrate is, uh, is known also as a possible charge transfer, so it could act as a, an electron sink and dope our, uh, our material. And otherwise, we could be in presence also only of, uh, of quantum confinement, which makes this, all of these three uh, phenomena make this system extremely interesting. But what is known is uh, the evolution of, uh, of the Fermi surface from the bulk case to the monolayer. In fact, if we look at the Fermi surface of the bulk, we have uh, all pockets at the zone center at the gamma point, and we have electron pocket at the zone boundary. And if we look at the Fermi surface as measured by Arpres in uh, the ultra thin film, what we observe is that the old pocket at the, zone, at the gamma point is gone and we are in presence only of uh, electron pockets. So a listed transition takes place in between. And this is, uh, is something that it is important to keep in mind for what I will show you later on. So in, uh, in, in our investigation, essentially we, 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 we studied how the bosonic degrees of freedom, which are the ones that Rix is sensitive to evolve from uh, the bulk case of uh, iron selenium to the uh, case of the iron selenium grown, uh, one unit cell grown on STO. On top of this, we had to place five nanometers of um, selenium capping layer in order to avoid any oxidation and degradation of the sample because these samples are unfortunately known to be pretty susceptible to air degradation. So as I said before, um, the first step when we perform a RIGS experiment is to measure X-ray absorption spectrum. And here I'm showing the X-ray absorption spectra as the high on L edge for the one unit cell film. And uh, first of all, this is a result that we were able to measure uh, to have spectroscopic measurements on the um, uh, monolayer material because uh, the limited amount of material precludes any, any strong signal. And on top of this, we also measured the absorption uh, spectrum of the bulk material. And uh, I'm showing in, uh, in this panel the X-ray absorption spectrum for the two of them. And what we can observe is that there is an extra shoulder on the one unicell film here, which it is compatible with the fact that we have electron doping from, from the substrate. And it might also be indicative of what I've shown you before on the evolution of the Fermi surface. Then the next step that we did was to measure the uh, rigs on uh, iron selenium bulk. And this is how a typical rigs spectra looks like for uh, bulk material. So we have in, uh, in the high energy loss region between one and six EV, a strong fluorescence background. And in the low energy region, we have the elastic line, uh, zero energy loss. And we can see here peaks of the spin excitations at different momentum. If we zoom in to see better these, uh, these peaks, we can see that these spin excitation peaks that I'm showing here disperse as a function of momentum. 
And this was observed for both crystallographic directions that we have investigated. The H0 direction and the HH directions, where you can see that along both of them, we have a, a pretty strong uh, spin excitation dispersion where we have high energy at high Q. And so as we, as we, as we decrease the Q, we um, decrease the spin excitation energy. Here I'm summarizing the results for the dispersion of the iron selenium bulk. So I'm plotting the energy as a function of momentum along the Q, along the two crystallographic directions that we have monitored. And you can see that we have a spin excitation dispersion that resembles the classical spin waves. And then we took also inelastic neutron, well, we took from the literature inelastic neutron scattering data, and we observed that there is a slight discrepancy between our RICS data and the neutron scattering data. And the reason for this is that um, inelastic neutron scattering data normally measures the spin excitation along the one zero direction, whereas RICS looks in proximity of the, of the gamma point. So in this case where we have no long range antiferromagnetic ordering, these two crystallographic directions are different. And this is the cause for um, the slightly different spin excitation dispersion. But now the next step uh, is to, to measure the spin, the, the risk spectra on iron selenium monolayer. And here I'm showing on this plot the, the Rick spectra at different momentum, momenta po momentum points along the H0 direction for, uh, for the monolayer case. This is pretty different from what we observed in the bulk case. So if we look in the high energy loss region from minus one EV up to three EV, we can see that we have a uh, a weaker, a much weaker fluorescence line compared to the bulk case. But more importantly is that we have a pretty strong peak at around 400 millev. And this peak doesn't disperse and changes energy with as a function of, uh, of momentum. In fact, this peak is essentially a, a, a flat mode. However, one of the questions that might emerge is whether this is a genuine excitation um, of, of our system. So in this case, it should behave in a Raman-like way or whether it is coming from an incoherent relaxation of the bands and it would behave in a fluorescence-like way. So because of this, we change the incident energy, which of course tunes the, the intensity but this was to demonstrate that the peak at 400 millev, it is a genuine Raman-like excitation, which means it is a coherent excitation of our system. <coughs> Sorry. The next step was to investigate the, the Rick spectrum along the uh, diagonal crystallographic directions. And here on the right-hand side, I'm plotting the Rick spectra that we observe which further corroborates what we have, so we have observed along the H0 direction. So we have a pretty uh, a strong excitation at around 400, 350 milli electron volt, and this excitation doesn't disperse as a function of energy. Now here, I, I want to give you takeaway messages that uh, in the one unit cell material, we have this excitation 400 millev that does not disperse as a function of Q. Additionally, we have a fluorescence that is uh, pretty different from, from the bulk and it implies a pretty strong change in the valence band. And finally, if we consider the spin excitation, this uh, implies that the spin excitation is and the low energy spectrum is pretty different and affected by the thickness. If we, now I want to, to, to summarize this experimental evidence in this plot where I'm showing the, the, the spin excitations 
measured for the bulk here and the non-dispersive flat mode for the one unicell material, which is hardened and it has lost any resemblance of, of a dispersing. Now, the, the origin of this peak could be, could be due to, to different types of, of excitation. So in order to better understand this, we performed calculation and uh, the calculations were performed by our collaborators at uh, University of Tennessee and uh, Oak Ridge. And they essentially did use the, the performed calculation of a bilayer Hubbard model, and where we and plus the DCA approximation, where they can they could tune the where they could tune the spectral function that I'm showing here as a color plot from a two-band system presented here on the left, which has a whole pocket close to the gamma point and an electron pocket at the zone boundary. And uh, by changing the, the parameters, they could tune this model into what is called an incipient band situation, where the old pocket at the gamma point is shifted below the Fermi level and only the electron pocket as the end point is, is left. After these initial uh, calculations, they could uh, extract the spin susceptibility, which is uh, what I'm presenting here. Additionally, in, in this model, it is important to, to disentangle between what is called intraband and interband susceptibility because the KZ can be taken as zero or pi. And here I'm presenting the results for these uh, spin susceptibilities for the two bands model here plotted on the left hand side and for the incipient band case plotted here on the, on the right hand side. And what we could observe that is that the intraband spin susceptibility presents the conventional dispersion of spin excitation in uh, magnetic material, which has a um, um, uh, zero energy as the gamma point at zero zero and then it increases the energies. Whereas the interband pocket it presents an antiphase dispersing. But most importantly is to look for, for the difference between the two band model and the incipient band model. And it is that the, the susceptibility becomes hardened, hardened in the incipient band case and also the spin susceptibility, especially the interband susceptibility, which is the strongest one becomes much flatter compared to the two band case. Now, uh, uh, we performed uh, a comparison, an extensive comparison between the, the theory and, uh, and our experimental data, which I'm presenting here in this pretty rich uh, spec uh, plot. So as a color plot, I'm reporting here the, the theory of the spin susceptibility. And as white dots, I'm presenting our experimental data. As dots, I'm presenting the data for the iron selenium bulk. And as diamonds, I'm presenting the data for the uh, single, for the monolayer case. On the top row, I'm also presenting the data for the intraband susceptibility. Whereas in the bottom row, we have the data for the interband susceptibility. So to, to make a pretty long story short, what we observe is that in the two band, in the two band case, it seems that the spin excitation of the bulk case, so the two band model, which is the one that should be able to describe the bulk case, we have a pretty good agreement between the intraband spin susceptibility and our experimental data. Whereas this is not true for the incipient band case or the, and, the, and the data that we have on the, on the monolayer case. However, when we look into the interband susceptibility, we observe a pretty good agreement between the case of the monolayer and the interband susceptibility. 
Uh, another thing that I would like to, to point to you is the fact that the absolute intensity of the susceptibility is much stronger for the interband case in both the incipient and the two band case as shown here on the right hand side of the of the color scheme. So these do because of these we we were in, we we consider uh, at the moment a fairly satisfactory uh, agreement with uh, experimental data. Now I will conclude because I think I am running a bit short of time. Um, with uh, our uh, measurements, uh, we, with our risk measurement on uh, spin excitation of iron selenium bulk, we had another chance to compare uh, our new spectroscopy with, uh, with cases that uh, were studied by Elastic Newton scattering, and we observed a pretty good agreement with, uh, well, a fairly good agreement with, uh, with uh, neutron data. And most importantly, we managed to perform successful high resolution RIX measurement on the monolayer case, detecting a strong renormalization of the low energy spin excitations. And um, this was concomitant also uh, with a suppression of conventional spin excitations that we observed in, uh, in the bar case. And in the monolayer case in particular, we detected a, an optical like mode at 400 milliEV. From the theory perspective, what is fair to say is that theory predicted an hardening and a flattening of the spin excitations in the incipient band case, which seems to describe fairly well the spectral function and ARPES data for the monolayer case. And additionally, based on the values of U over T that we used and additional uh, calculations, these, uh, um, these, uh, these values that were used for, uh, to achieve these results are in a pretty good agreement with an increase of um, critical temperature and uh, pair coupling strength. And now I will jump to this slide where I would like to acknowledge all of uh, the collaborators that uh, I had the pleasure to work with. I will not name all of them, Particular, I want to acknowledge the, the people at Brookhaven National Lab, in particular Valentina Bisogni, and uh, my, my former uh, supervisor at MIT, Ricardo Comin, and uh, people for theory support at the University of Tennessee, Stephen Johnston, and uh, at Oak Ridge, in particular Thomas Meyer, etc. And after this, I want to thank all of you for, uh, for your attention. All right, thanks, Jonathan, for just for sharing these nice results and rich physics with us. So now we have time for questions. So if anyone has a question, feel free to mute yourself and do your question. There is uh, Greg. You can you can unmute yourself, can't you, Greg? Yes. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, very nice talk, Johnny. I, I wanted to ask a question about um, what the limitations of RICS would be in terms of materials. So are there particular materials that are not somehow amenable to using RICS to study them? And, and if so, what, it, what is it about those materials that somehow makes RICS not a, a useful technique for them? Well, um, good point. So um, in terms of thickness, as I showed you, we can go as thin as one unit cell. Concerning also the size of the sample, which is uh, another pretty important point, for example, in neutron scattering, we were able to measure flakes, which were 10 micron times 10 micron large because uh, experimentally we have uh, a beam size which is one times 10 micron. So in terms of beam size and sample size, we can go thin and also small. Mm -hmm. What uh, RICS requires 
is resonances. So in this case, for example, uh, especially for soft X-ray rigs, um, we can access all of the 3D transition metals. So from titanium to copper, we can access all of them. We can access oxygen. What, for example, we cannot access is the L edge of 5D transition metals because uh, those are in, a, in the energy range of uh, hard X-rays, which require a completely different type of instrumentation, which uh, as a more, which a TSIX and a TSNS should we don't have. Mm -hmm. And uh, what at the moment is really hard in terms of instrumentation are the 4D transition metals because uh, they fall in an energy window, which is called, which is a so-called tender range, where there is not really a good optics for using those uh, X-rays at the moment. So the, I mean, earlier we talked about the iridates. Um, this is, that's not the L edge that's relevant for the iridates. I mean, that's a 5D transition metal. The iridates, for example, uh, there have been beautiful studies as the iridium L edge, but those are done at a different types of instrumentation because the L edge of iridium is at 11.5 kilo electron volt. Uh -huh. What it can be done and what we did in the past for iridates is to use oxygen K. So we could... Uh, select uh, the oxygen K peak and the hybridization peak with iridium. And through hybridization, we could uh, study the spin excitations in that case, because that is a special case where there is a pretty strong spin orbit coupling. And so we could observe similar spin excitation as the oxygen K and the iridium L edge. But in principle, Riggs can study also phonons at the oxygen K edge. So another possibility for, uh, for, uh, for example, this is something that was done on ruthenium is not to use the L edge, but to use the M edge, which is a bit weaker. And it involves a transition, not from a 2P to 3D transition, but from 3P into 3D. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of a related question Sounded like from your answer that, that there are different facilities um, that may have different optics and can handle different edges. That's correct. So like worldwide, how many RICS facilities are there that are, you know, producing good results? Well, uh, I would say for the soft X-ray RICS, I would say at the moment, the state of the art is uh, Brookhaven, Diamond Light Source in England, uh, ESRF in uh, France, uh, Swiss Light Source, and there is a program in, uh, in Taiwan and Japan. Okay. For hard X-rays, which is uh, the one concerning iridates and all of the 5D transition metals, there is a pretty strong program at uh, Advanced Light Source at ESRF and uh, in Japan. Okay, so soft x-rays, there are like, you know, five or six facilities and hard x-rays, a couple. Yes, at the moment, yes. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, no, it's good to have a sense of kind of um, what's going on uh, worldwide in this area. All right, thank you very much. Welcome. So I have a question. Um, so can, can Rick's measure zero sum? I, I had a lot of static. Can Rick's measure zero sound? Zero sound? Yes. Well, I'm not sure I understand what, what zero sound is. It's the bosonic uh, shape fluctuations of the Fermi surface. Uh, here you, 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 good point. So 
here you are entering into a, an unexplored land because uh, all on, on these, uh, uh, I would say, unconventional bosonic excitations, uh, Rix has not been explored much, both in terms of experiments and, uh, and uh, theory. So for example, people were mentioning that it is possible to measure superconducting gaps and also phase fluctuations and also additional weird bosonic modes. But as far as I know, experimentally it has never been observed. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a weird bosonic mode. It's, it's, a, it's there for all Fermi liquids. Well, um, as far as I know, no one has ever detected. Okay. But uh, maybe I, I, I should make a, a, a more precise statement. Currently, also, we should keep in mind that uh, there is a limitation of uh, the RICS resolution because the best facility worldwide can measure 20, 30 millev in terms of energy resolution, whatever is below that, it's not uh, uh, really detectable. And what's the momentum resolution? Well, the momentum resolution is actually pretty high. It is uh, on the order of uh, 0.01 angstrom to the minus one. Okay, thanks. Hi, Johnny, how are you? So good, yeah. Fine, thanks. So I wanted to ask a question about the second part of your talk about the uh, iron selenide uh, monolayer. So the, the calculation of Thomas, I think Thomas and his student, uh, so the DCA calculation was done on a single orbital Hubble model? Uh, two orbital Hubble model. So uh, can you comment on the role of the Hun coupling was chosen like standard value of the Hun coupling? Uh, so, so uh, when you compare the experiment to the theory, um, um, can you identify that kind of um, optical mode with uh, uh, the... So that's... Um, so what I'm asking is the, how the results, the theory results change with the Hun coupling, so... Well, we, in the theory, we, we actually played a bit with, uh, with different values. Uh, uh, in terms of ANS coupling and also U over T. And what we observed is that overall, the trends were pretty similar and they were pretty robust. So as soon as you are able to tune the spectral function from a two band system into an incipient band system, what you get is that for the uh, Kz equals zero, Q per, Q per equals zero, you get this optical-like dispersion, whereas when you put the Q per equal pi, it is flatter. And in the incipient band case, it, is, it, it always shows up at higher energy and also at, um, uh, it, it, it flattens. So these, these arc that you see becomes much less pronounced. So I would say that within a, a reasonable parameter space, the, the data are, so sorry, the calculations are, are, are robust. So which are saying the home coupling is playing no role? This, or little yeah. role, role, okay. Of course, we, within, within reason. So what you're saying is mainly um, this optical mode is really um, very familiar with chain physics. So it's kind of very similar to having one chain uh, that has dispersion, right? Dispersionless mode. And when you couple two chains, you have a uh, a gap opening, right? In the uh, in the um, QZ uh, or uh, in the QZ equals two pi, right? So. I yeah, I guess you, you can think to, uh, to have two chain one on top of each other, one next to each other. And in this case, you could consider two planes. 
two plane, yeah, of course. This is two planes, of course, yeah. So I see. Principle could be similar minus, you know, the differences from from the dimensionality that you know pretty well. Thanks. Okay. I can hear you pretty weakly. Sorry, I had the, the mic. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so when you, you show your data, uh, you focus on a window of a width of about one electron volt and uh, the spin excitations within this window. And um, I just wonder, you know, imagine you had a multi insulator with a gap of uh, two or three EV, for instance. Can you look at the excitations on the upper Haber band or, or, or not? How high in energy can you go? Well, in soft X-ray rigs, we can go up to 10, 12 EV. So we, I mean, it's, it's pretty common to observe charge transfer excitations in, for example, in cuprates and nickelates up to five EV. It's a pretty broad featureless peak. So we, we are able to see crystal field excitations between one and three V and easily up to seven, eight, 10 V in one single shot. And uh, another question, is it possible to do stimulated X-ray scattering? In principle, yes, but not at a synchrotron radiation facility. Because for stimulated, stimulated X-ray scattering, what you need is a pretty short pulse with high density, with a, and the pulse should be shorter than the OJ, the K time. And um, in a synchrotron radiation, you get uh, an X-ray beam, which is uh, continuous. If you want to do that types of experiment, uh, you have to go to a free electron laser where the accelerator machine has a completely different uh, structure and they can compress electron bunches that they would emit in a pretty short time scale and an X-ray an X-ray beam, which is discontinuous and not continuous like in a, in a synchrotron source. As far as, I know, as far as I know, it has been done on silicon at uh, in Hamburg at the synchrotron at the free electron laser in Hamburg by I think Alexander Folish. Any other question? Well, I don't see any questions. So uh, we stop the streaming now. If you want to join us after the talk, feel free to stay with us in the Zoom meeting. See you next week. <laughs>